so thank you. Thank you. It's a real privilege to be a part of this program. <clears throat> I am a cell biologist, and um, what the work I do is a little bit different than traditional cell biology in that the question that we ask is how do chemicals get into cells? And <clears throat> we live in the legacy of the 20th century optimism about chemicals. There are chemicals in every product. There are flame retardants in our mattresses. There are plastics in our cars. There are funky materials I couldn't describe to you in every one of our smartphones. They're everywhere. And here are some interesting facts about them. 85,000 synthetic industrial chemicals produced in the last century. 5,000 of these are high production volume chemicals. That means we produce them at levels of 1,000 metric uh, tons or more. Some of these are very high production volume chemicals. You'll hear about this later today. Things that are produced at volumes of tens of thousands of metric tons uh, a year. And what, and what this means is when you make that much of anything, these chemicals go places they shouldn't. And in each and every one of your bodies right now, if we could draw your blood and send it off to a really good analytical lab, we'd easily be able to measure three to 500 of these chemicals. So here's the problem. How do we know which ones are gonna be problems? And how do we predict before we even make these chemicals and release them into the wild if they're gonna be problems for you? Okay, so there are two ways we've done this. There's the historic way, which is really based, it has its roots in chemistry, and I call, I call it the old-fashioned way, if you will. And it's you ask a chemical, you look at the physical properties of a chemical, and you go, if this thing looks like it's gonna cross a membrane, maybe it's bad news, maybe it'll get into your body. There's a problem with that. Most of the chemicals that all of you recognize as being potentially problematic, mercury, DDT, PCB, these are all chemicals that didn't behave. They got into your body at levels that are much higher than we would have predicted by their physical properties alone. So the approach that we take in our lab is to understand the mechanisms that a cell uses to determine that something is a toxicant and to try to keep it out. And <clears throat> I'm going to set up a little analogy here, which is a cell is a little bit like a nightclub, okay? <laughs> it needs to decide who gets in, who doesn't get in. All right, so some molecules are apparently better looking than others. <laughs> and, and the way they do that are with these proteins called multidrug transporters. <clears throat> and as you know, I'm, I'm um, one of these science fellows, and so we were focused on communication, and I showed this slide to the other fellows, and they said, you know, you gotta come up with something simpler to explain this. <laughs> so I, I scoured the literature, and I found that, which is... <laughs> and they said, no. Nah. And so, so, so your cells have bouncers. They really do. And those, and, and, and those bouncers decide who gets in and who stays out. And they're very important. And it turns out we've known about these proteins for about 40 years, and we actually use them in drug development. So there's no point developing a drug if it's not gonna cross your intestine or not gonna cross your blood-brain barrier and never get into your body, what's the point? Um, and these transporters are just the tip of the iceberg. It turns out, we've surveyed genomes, um, and, and it turns out that there are about two to 300 different chemical defense genes in our genome. And embryos use these things very extensively to keep chemicals out. And the FDA is on to this, so we, we, we actually test chemicals when we're trying to make them into foods and drugs um, for their likelihood to get into your body. And so what we do in my lab are two very simple things to try to answer the question of how chemicals are gonna be problematic for embryos. The first one is we try to identify all of the protective genes that an embryo might be using. And the second one is to map them in embryos, figure out where they're all located in space and time so that we can understand why, for example, one set of cells is especially vulnerable to a chemical, another set is not. Uh, we use a sea urchin. This is the organism we use in my lab. It's a model system. It has a completely sequenced genome. Um, they are, why do I use a sea urchin? This is, you know, some of you should be asking. Sea urchins are remarkable. This one female sea urchin is gonna produce about a million eggs in 10 minutes. This is really a remarkable source of material. These are major model systems in cell and developmental biology. And to put that to you another way, this one sea urchin is producing 5,000 mouse equivalents of eggs. That's a lot of material to work with. 
okay? And here's my grad student, Joe, and he's just going nuts with this. This is 50,000 mouse equivalents of eggs. Huge amount of material. And, <clears throat> and um, I want to leave you with one lesson from the work we're getting. So how can we use this to predict which chemicals are problems? Cells have bouncers. So why did this drug thalidomide, this terrible drug thalidomide, cause these horrific birth defects? And, and thalidomide's enjoying a bit of a resurgence in the clinic because it's being used to treat very aggressive drug-resistant cancers. And it turns out that the, very, the secret to this is that um, these transporters don't recognize thalidomide as a bad, a bad uh, actor. And so we have some very simple lessons from the cell biology of how cells keep chemicals out that we can use, and that is that we want to design chemicals. And, and before we put them in the environment, make sure that cells can keep them out. Um, so I'll end my talk there. If anyone has any questions, please come find me afterwards, and you can look up our lab and the wonderful people in it at hemdunlab.org. Thank you all very much.